Miigwech Anne-Marie. Miigwech uh, and um, Unity. Such a beautiful song, the, bear, the spirit bear song, and, and such a good way to start us off. So Miigwech uh, Kwewuk. Ani Kinawea. Anka Dons in Dijnakas. Maingan Ned Dodem. Chippewas of Georgina Island and Dunjaba, Nishinabe and Dao. Us and Dao. Quis. In Dao, a debajimit in Dao. Gitchinendam ayayam on P in the Gaujuan Nung, Nungo Dibakak. Gitchinendam Wab in the Gok, Kinaguea. For those of you who don't speak Anishinaabe, I just said hey. Um, and uh, for those of you who do, I apologize. Bungi et the Goan Nishnabem one. I'm just learning the language of, uh, of my ancestors that my grandparents spoke fluently, uh, but I am learning, doing my best. Um, what I said was my name, my clan, the community that I'm from. Uh, I said that I'm a father, I said that I'm a son. And in fact, my mother is here this evening. Sharon McHugh. She likes to describe herself these days as a little old lady, so I'm going to get her to stand up. <clears throat> Sharon McHugh. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of having dinner this evening with a, gr- a group of people from Trent University, and a lot of them said, I remember you when you were this big. <laughs> um, of course, my, my dad uh, and mom played a big role here at Trent University, not only were they alumni, uh, but my dad went on to co-found the Native Studies Department, then called the Native Studies Department. And so I grew up here um, in, in many ways. Uh, I was a skateboard rat, along with Jamie Standen, uh, here on the, uh, on the campus all over the place before skateboarding was even cool. Um, and, and all those people that, that said, I remember when you were... This, this, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about someone who remembers me when I was this small. Uh, Professor Dan Longboat may have been one of those ones that remembers me when I was this small because I remember this. Dan, when he was graduating and going off in, into the then sunset in a very cool sports car, I think, <laughs> I was this big, like maybe even that big, and he came up to me and he gave me a card. Nobody had business cards back in the 70s, you know, but Dan had a business card, and he gave me a card. And he said, I'm the first person you call when you end up in jail. (laughs) Um, That's good native uncle energy there from from Dan. I I didn't have to call, but I carried the card around. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here this evening, uh, and, and uh, it it's really is a pleasure for me to be here. I'm so excited uh, to have been invited by Lakefield and Trent and the Canoe Museum, all of which are, are, are such special places. Um, something else that I said in the Nishnabam one is, Edbajimit in Dao, which means literally, I'm one who tells stories, or I'm a journalist. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about this evening, is... is uh, a story that I've spent a lot of time covering over my 25 years at CBC. Uh, it's a story that I covered pretty much my whole career, uh, Indian residential schools. And uh, I think I'm going to spend the most time on, a, on the most recent kind of version of that story that I told, which is a podcast called Cooper Island, which I did for CBC Podcasts. And I'm going to take you behind the scenes of it a little bit, tell you a little bit about what I experienced in that, and, and, and hopefully try to distill some of the lessons that I learned uh, through, through that whole, whole journey. Um, how many of you have been to the Gulf Islands in British Columbia? Raise your hand. Cool. Yeah, lots. So just what, for those of you who haven't been to Gulf, the Gulf Islands, for um, people who are here, just shout out some of the things that, that you come to mind when you think about the Gulf Islands. Black bears. Black bears. 
Whales, yes, whales, of course. In the Salish Sea, there are lots of orcas. Swimming, Swimming beautiful, beautiful ocean. Whales, yes. Forests, massive, giant forests. Big water, big water. Um, when I think about the Gulf Islands, I mean, it's just, it's such an idyllic place. Majestic, you know, those, those white shell beaches. And you go to the Gulf Islands, you go to places like Salt Spring and, and uh, Galliano, and there's all these artist studios and, and uh, B&Bs, and, and they're kind of famous for the, the, you know, the wellness vibe when you go to the Gulf Islands. Uh, all of these things, of course, have made the Gulf Islands one of Canada's top tourist destinations. Um, this is one of the Gulf Islands, a place called Penelican. Cooper Island is what the settlers called the place. They named it after a fellow that was on one of the warships that came to the Salish Sea. Unlike those other Gulf Islands, Galliano and, and Salt Spring and Pender, the tourists don't often stop at Penelicate. Perhaps the main reason that the tourists don't stop at Penelicate is because it's an Indian reserve. But there aren't any yoga retreats on Penelicate Island. There aren't any B&Bs. There's no farmer's markets. There's no seaside cafes. Penelicate doesn't even have any stores on it. It doesn't have a gas station. So in the eyes of, of some people, I suppose that, that Penelicate, if I, if I asked a word for you to describe Penelicate, some people might call it impoverished. If I was to ask the people from Penelicate how they might describe Penelicate, I think they'd probably describe it as their homeland. Because that, you see that tip, that point there? That's known as Penelicate Spit. The name of the island comes from the Hokaminam language, Penelicath. And I apologize if there are any Hulkamelem speakers here because I didn't do a good job on that either. Penelica. Uh, and the root of that verb is to bury. And the name Penelica comes from this very, very old story amongst the Hulkamelem about, about a time somewhere at the beginning of time, even before the beginning of time. And, and there were only birds and, and animals living on the island at that time. And it was a time when the first people first arrived at Penelicate, and they emerged from a log. And they made their home in two logs, one of which was half buried in the sand. And that's where the name of the island comes from, Penelicate, to be buried. And the descendants of those first peoples who lived in the log also built their homes there from time out of mind. And when you look at that beach, right there, this is where it all happened. There were rows and rows and rows of massive giant longhouses there. You mentioned the, the giant forests that are so impressive when any of us go to British Columbia. Those longhouses were made from the, they were, they were hewn from those rainforests, those BC coastal hewn uh, rainforests. Such impressive architecture that the people, the Hulkamium people and the people from Penelicate built. And they had such a rich, and complex and vibrant society there that lasted for generations, from time out of mind, until 1890. Something happened in 1890. Something happened in 1890 on this island that changed the character of the place, and it changed the character of the people in ways that they had never experienced before. This is the, the Cooper Island Indian Residential School. And it began operating in 1890 on Cooper Island. And, and I want to be very clear about something. Make no mistake about this. That what was happening in the late 1800s in British Columbia, in the province now known as British Columbia, was absolutely a clash of civilizations. That's what was going on. Two civilizations coming together that did not understand each other. 
And in this clash of settilizations, civilizations, that school, the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, was the weapon of choice of the settlers. And I use that word very purposefully. It was a weapon because it was designed from the get-go to kill the Indian in the child. And for nearly 100 years, the Cooper Island Indian Residential School operated on this island and generations upon generations of Hulkaminam children ended up on that wharf being unloaded by ferry to go to school at the Cooper Island School. And now in 2023, when students are gathered in places like this and are learning this history, thankfully, in ways that they perhaps didn't back in, in Dan's days when he was here at Trent, people ask why. Why did this happen? According to this news article from 1925, the school, the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, was a place where Native children were trained to be useful citizens of Canada. That was the rosy picture that was painted for Canadians, through the media, by the way. And we now know thanks to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and thanks to the words of survivors, we now know that that school, the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, was never about education. The Cooper Island Indian Residential School was an attack upon families. And in many ways, it succeeded. It, it lay waste to entire generations of the Hulkaminam people, their families and their children their culture, until it was finally closed in 1975. And it didn't take very long, about only a couple of years after it was closed in 1975, the Penelica people ripped that building down and they burned it to the ground. They wanted nothing more to do with that place. They didn't want it on their island anymore. So this was the history that I set out to explore uh, back in 2021 when I was asked by CBC to do a podcast on Indian residential schools. This was the history that I was hoping to try to learn more about and to try to tell Canadians about uh, when I headed off to Penelican. This is what the island looks like now. Um, when the ferry pulls up to the island of Penelican, you can still see it there, uh, that long wooden wharf that was built so that the kids could be dropped off at the school, that wharf is still there. The school was ripped down, but the wharf is still there, and there's still uh, a row of cement stairs that led up to the school. Those are the only things that are left of the school. But as you walk around, as you get off the ferry, you drive off the ferry, and you walk around the island of Penelicate, the thing that you quickly, quickly realize is that the buildings the Cooper Island Indian Residential School buildings may be long gone, but the memories of that place are still incredibly, incredibly alive amongst the people that live on the island today. And, and it, I'll tell you why, because as you, this, this, is, this is where the school used to stand. I'm looking out, same, same picture that was right there. I'm looking out at the water there. But behind me, uh, all these contemporary and modern buildings have grown up on the former site. So just behind me is an adult ed center. There's a daycare. There's a health center. Uh, there's a big house, a long house, which is what the, the Hulkamina people use, where they gather in their ceremonies during their winter spirit dances. They come together as, as community and gather in the big house. All of these things are built on the former grounds of the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, including their band office. Um, and so the school may be gone, except for those cement stairs and the wharf, 
But community members line up for the ferry every day. The kids go across to the mainland every day, lined up, reminded of all the things that happened in that very spot, in that ground. They're constantly reminded of what they endured there, even if they didn't attend the school, the school themselves. So that first trip that I went to Penelicate, myself and, and my producer, Jody Martinson, uh, we went to the band office and, and we met this very imposing group of people. <laughs> this was the elders committee. They were the first people that we were uh, instructed to meet if we were going to pursue a podcast at, at Penelicate. And, and we were there to tell them about the podcast and to ask permission to do the podcast. And the elders all looked at us and said, what's a podcast? Um, so after we tried to explain what a podcast was, um, you know, it's, it's always humbling. It's always humbling when you meet elders because, because, you know, to us, our elders are more than just seniors. You know, they're our Google, if you will. Uh, you know, the, the, back in the day, they were repositories of, of knowledge and wisdom. And so I'm, I always feel a little bit humbled and awestruck when I, when I meet an elder. And, and when an elder speaks, you, you know, you know you better darn well listen, right? So we're here to do this podcast and, we, and we're asking the elders in particular about a very difficult subject, unmarked graves. And one by one, slowly but surely, the elders began to speak to us and tell us stories. And it didn't take very long. I'm a Nishnabe, Remnant Hulkaminam. I'm an outsider to that place, just like many of us in this room would be. And it didn't take very long before the hurt, before the distrust, <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, became palpable. to Jody and I who were there with microphones. And, and I may be an Anishinaabe storyteller, I may be an, an indigenous journalist, but I couldn't blame them. You know, why should they trust someone from the outside who comes to them and says, I want to tell your story? Why? Why, why should they trust someone like me? when so much has been taken away from them. And so this is us meeting with, with the elders and, and you don't see me here, you see Jody. Uh, this was during the, the, I think I can't remember what wave of the pandemic it was, but, but Jody's wearing a mask there in the corner, gathering sound. Jody, Jody was gathering sound and I felt like I was walking this tightrope. I was walking this tightrope with these elders because I was there for a very important reason, to talk about unmarked graves. But I so badly wanted to impress upon them that I wanted to be a storyteller, not a story taker. They'd had lots of that already, story takers. And I was there to ask about unmarked graves, which was, made things even more complicated and difficult. As we sat there for hours and hours and hours and went through the Tim Hortons donuts um, one by one, they began to tell a lot of stories. And one story kept coming up over and over again. It was about a boy who had died at Cooper Island, Cooper Island School. The elders wanted me to know about him. The boy's name was Richard. And Richard was there were 167 recorded deaths at the Keeper Island Indian Residential School, but Richard was one boy that a lot of these survivors, this generation of survivors, couldn't forget. Because the way that he died was so disturbing to them, so upsetting, that they couldn't forget it. They couldn't leave it out of their mind. It marked a whole generation of survivors at, the, at, at Penelicut. And Richard's death was over 50 years ago, but the elders and the survivors of the school still whispered about what had happened. 
There was still a mystery hanging around what happened to Richard. And it was causing pain and hurt in that community. And that was very obvious as we sat there and listened to the elders. The place that Richard died was just one more place the community members had to drive by almost every day if they were going to get on the ferry. It was the school gym at the Cooper Island School. That's where Richard Thomas was found hanging in the school gym on June 2nd, 1960. So we heard this story. And the elders gave us permission to spend time, months, which turned into a year, at Penelicate, learning more about the deaths at the school, but learning more about Richard in particular. And we found lots of official records as we started to dig into the Richard story. According to the official records, he was discovered by two Oblate brothers who taught at the school. A coroner concluded that Richard committed suicide while well, he was in a state of despondency. But the challenging thing for producers, Jody Martinson and Martha Troyan and I, was that those official records didn't line up with what we were hearing from survivors about the circumstances surrounding Richard's death. We heard disturbing testimony about children having to witness Richard hanging in the school gym. And in fact, we were told by some that children were forced, forced to view Richard hanging in the gym. And we spent a lot of time in the podcast trying to figure out what happened to Richard. What happened? This mystery that had been hanging over this community for so long. But, I mean, we did find some answers. We, we, we did find some answers, and, and I'll refer you to the podcast if you, if you want to find out more. Because, I mean, the point of what we were trying to do wasn't to create a true crime whodunit. That was not the point of us asking more questions about what happened to Richard. I think probably the most important goal for Martha and Jody and I was that we wanted the world to know more about Richard. We wanted them to know about this boy for more than his tragic death. And so that led us to Belvi, Belvi Breber. This is Belvi. Belvi is, is Richard's uh, older sister. Belvi loves Tim Horton's ice caps with a twist of strawberry. I was like, she said, remember the strawberry, because I had to bring her a Tim Horton's ice cap every time that I, that, I, that I saw her. She said, remember the strawberry. And she also loves the Blue Jays. Probably not smiling quite so big, given what happened with the Blue Jays this fall. Uh, but. You know, big Blue Jays fan, Belvi Breber. Belvi uh, also attended the Cooper Island Indian Residential School in the 1950s and 60s. She graduated before her brother Richard. And as we sat and talked and learned more from Belvi about how awful the conditions were at the Cooper Island School, fortunately, we also learned a lot more about Richard. So this is Richard Thomas. Uh, this is only one of only two photos that Belvi has of him. Richard was a favorite of his mom. Uh, Richard was friendly. Everybody that we met told us that Richard was this incredibly friendly young boy. Um, abuse was common at the Cooper Island Indian Residential School. Uh, that shouldn't surprise anybody, but what was just as common was student-on-student -student abuse. Uh, boys beating up other boys. Boys abusing girls. 
Um, Richard wasn't like that. We heard that over and over again, that Richard was the kind of boy that stuck up for the little boys that were getting hurt. He was the kind of boy that looked out for the other boys. He had a big heart, Richard did. Richard was a boy with dreams. He told his family that he wanted to be a priest, which might strike you as a bit of a funny thing now, looking back on it, but at that time, in the 1960s, that was a really, really, really big deal. The priests in the church played a really huge role in Native communities back then. And he didn't see Native priests in the 1960s because it was a position of authority. And Native people in the 1960s didn't have a lot of authority or control over their own lives. But Richard wanted to be a priest, from which I can ascertain that Richard was a boy with aspirations. And it was neat to learn that. He was a good student. Uh, he was a writer. He was always scribbling in his journal. And I had a chance to read some of the entries in his journal. And, and through that, I, bega I began to learn that, that he was uh, a creative, a boy who loved creative writing. So we began to learn all these things about Richard, and then we learned, when we found out about his love of creative writing, we learned something even more surprising. Richard was actually a published writer. And my friend Drew Hayden Taylor is here. He knows how hard that is, being a published writer. Richard uh, was published in this book called Tales of the Longhouse. It's a collection of legends. Uh, written by First Nations children from Vancouver Island, uh, gathered, um, who went out and gathered stories about elders. And, and this version of the book is a bit of a dusty relic. It was published in 1973. But Richard has three stories in it. Couldn't believe it. One of the stories is about a boy who turned into a deer. Another one is about a, a girl who transformed into a crow. And the third story, the last one, was an origin story about his people, the Halalt tribe. And that story was told to him by his father, Stan Thomas. And I'm just going to tell the short version of it. Uh, it's a legend about a man who, who lived a long, long, long time ago, all by himself. And then one day he was out hunting, and he saw a creature that he had never seen before. He saw a creature that was walking around on two legs. And he didn't know what that was. So according to the legend, the hunter ends up trapping this creature and discovers it's a woman. So I'm going to read you the end of the story. These are the words of Richard Thomas. The man decided to call his woman Halalt after a beautiful fish he had one day seen his father catch because he thought that she too was beautiful. She decided to call him Mishkin. And when they were very old, they had many grandchildren. These young people wanted to call themselves the Mishkins, but he said before he died, this is Halalt's tribe. There is still a tribe called Halalt. I know this because I am one. It kind of gives me goosebumps just uh, even reading it right now. Uh, it gives me goosebumps for a couple of reasons. Despite the incredible colonizing experience that Richard was subjected to going to the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, there is still a confidence there in that voice of his. There's still a pride in where he comes from. And so when we read these words going on this journey that we were on, it was almost as if Richard was speaking to us like he wanted us to know something, like he was guiding us on our journey. Another thing that we discovered about Richard is that, unlike a lot of children who went to residential school across the country, Richard came home. He was buried at the Halalt First Nation Cemetery, and that gave his family some measure of comfort, because as we know, so many families 
did not have their children come home. What we were trying to do with this podcast, the Cooper Allen podcast, was we were trying to get people to understand that the death of a child, that it ripples. It ripples through generations. And we were hoping that by telling Richard's story, we might be able to put the face to one of these deaths at residential school to one boy to help people understand that. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation's latest count for the number of children who died in Canada's Indian residential school is 4,130 and counting. And we will never know much about most of them. We won't know what they wanted to be when they grew up. We won't know about their dreams. And Indigenous communities have known about these deaths for a really long time. Not news. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission knew about these deaths for quite a long time. Published a volume about it when they released the report in 2015. Not news. But a lot of Canadians didn't know that story or hadn't heard that story or weren't listening to that story. So this is Toronto on Canada Day in 2021. That's me walking down, well, it's not me, but I, that's me walking down the street. Um, not long after the announcement of 200 unmarked graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School, people in Toronto gathered and people in cities right across the country gathered, not wearing red and white, but wearing orange. There were thousands and thousands of people walking downtown Toronto. They stopped all the traffic. People of all different colors, all different races, all different sizes, and ages. I was there with my children and my partner and her daughter. And there were speeches, there were speeches in City Hall. There were people that wanted clean drinking water for First Nations in this country. There were powerful speeches about wanting to, to, to reduce the numbers of Indigenous people who are incarcerated in this country, wanting to reduce the numbers of children who are scooped by child welfare agencies. There were powerful speeches about wanting justice. And I'll tell you, standing in that place, listening to these people with all of these people demanding justice on that day, it gave me hope. It gave, it, gave, it, it, it gave me hope that something could change. But as so often happens, <laughs> when we have these moments like this in this country, the day after the protest, some of that energy began to wane. Those calls for justice began to get quieter. And in the days after that big crowd gathered in Toronto and cities right across country, it made me think of John Breber. John is Belvie's son. And um, Richard would have been John's uncle. So when we were recording the Cooper Island podcast, Canada had just made the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation a statutory holiday. And I asked him specifically about this, about what he thought about the holiday. And I want to play just a short, really short audio clip. Babin's going to help me out here. He's going to pull it up for me. This is a really short audio clip of what John Breber thought about this new idea of a statutory holiday for truth and reconciliation. I asked John if it matters to him that there's a new statutory holiday to recognize truth and reconciliation. Canadians from coast to coast to coast marked it by wearing orange, a color that's come to symbolize the suffering of survivors. Of the 48 years of this, 
I don't need a day to be to reflect on residential school. It's been a major part of my life. But the rest of the country, if you feel good putting on an orange shirt, then you know, get on board. Show some support. It warms your heart. I think you can hear the bitterness in John's voice. I see some people nodding. And, and I don't think John would disagree. I don't disagree. The stat holiday for truth and reconciliation is a good thing. It's a good thing to raise awareness. It's a necessary thing, and it's important that we raise awareness and generate support. But I think what you hear in John's voice is this question, what is it going to take to start to actually correct some of the injustices in this country? What would it take to sustain the urgency of having thousands of people gathered in a square wearing orange t-shirts? So, can you guys help me out? Okay, so Babin, we, we're gonna we're gonna do the tricky thing here. So, so there's a QR code. Okay, you got you got phones, you got phones. I'm gonna do this exercise that I saw Murray Sinclair do, who was of course the the the, the chair of the TRC. My mother's looking at me. She said, "I didn't bring my phone. <coughs> you didn't tell me about this, Duncan. Um, if you've got a phone." Scan the QR code, okay? And this is an exercise, full credit to Murray, Murray Sinclair. Uh, he's do, he did this and I'm, I thought it was very effective. Um, so you'll scan the code um, and you should be able to get into the app. And what I want you to do, once you get into that app, it's gonna say, pick, choose a photo. Do you have photos of children on your phone? I bet most of us do. Most of us have photos of children. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Those photos, post, if you can, post your photo. It'll say pick a photo. Pick a photo of that favorite child that you have on your phone and post it up here for me, okay? And I'll tell you, it's going to be shown up on the screen. Uh, I'll delete them all afterwards, okay? I'm not going to share them anywhere publicly. If you feel uncomfortable sharing that photo of that child, is it working? Yeah. yeah? Okay. If you feel uncomfortable sharing the photo of that child, what I want you to do is just lean over to your neighbor right now and show them that child. Or post the photo and do the, tell, your, tell your neighbor right now about the child that you just picked, that photo. Take a couple minutes. Go ahead. Tell them, tell them why that child is so special to you. Tell them why you got a picture of them on your phone. Tell them, tell them what, he was, what he or she or they were doing that day. Okay, so just, just take, take a few seconds to, to tell your neighbor about that, that child. And then Babin and I are gonna pull up that screen. Are we, are we getting some pictures? Oh yes, tons of pictures. Okay, so let's pull it up. There we go. So here are some of the photos that you're posting of the children that we're seeing on our phones. That guy looked like he just graduated. <laughs> oh, goodness. Aw. Honey, Nimosh. Holy cow, look at the size of that apple. That is amazing. <clears throat> and it's such a big, oh yeah, sport. There's a, there's a football fan. I have to say when Anne Maria was reading out my list of accomplishments, perhaps the biggest accomplishment that I was proud of when she was reading it out was that undefeated under 15 hockey team back in the day. Oh, I'm so happy to see all these, all these young people. Oh, look at that little one going by. Oh, that's a really little one, <clears throat> little banoon jeans. Aww. Okay, thank you so much for sharing those, those pictures of your loved ones, your children. I assume they're, they're, they're nephews and nieces and grandbabies and daughters and sons. 
So here's what I would like you to do now. I'd like you to go to that photo, that child that you posted, and I'd like you to delete it, please. Delete it from your phone. And then I want you to go and find the rest of the photos of that child and I want you to start deleting them from your phone. So we'll take a couple minutes while you do all that deleting. People are laughing. You're not deleting your pictures right now? No? How come? Yeah, I wouldn't delete my photos. No way. There's not a chance. There's no way I'd delete those photos. Those photos, these photos are precious. I don't blame anyone that wouldn't want to delete those photos. But maybe it might help you understand, it might help Canadians understand, that those old black and white archival photos that we see of residential schools every time that someone tells a story about truth and reconciliation, those are not dusty relics for indigenous people. To indigenous people and our communities, those photos are our relatives. And they got deleted. And I think that maybe if Canadians understood that connection a little bit better, that maybe, maybe, we'd do more than just talk about reconciliation in this country. I think maybe we'd do more than read a land acknowledgement at the opening of presentations. I think maybe we'd start practicing reconciliation in our everyday lives, whether it is at our places of worship or our schools or our workplaces. And I'll tell you something, after, after we launched the Cooper Island podcast, I got flooded by emails, and it happens every time that I do a residential school story, I got flooded by emails from listeners who listened very intently, and people send me notes and they say, I wanna do more, Duncan, I want to do more. But they say, I don't know how. I don't know what to do. What should I do, Duncan? Where do I start? And so I got about five more minutes or so left, and I want to shift gears. I've been talking about Cooper Island Indian Residential School and Richard Thomas, but I want to shift gears into talk about r r r reconciliation um, and what you can do. So we'll bring the slideshow back up again. And I wasn't stuttering when I said r r r r reconciliation. There are three R's in reconciliation, and I want to walk you through what the three R's are, okay? The three R's in reconciliation are relationships, respect, and reciprocity. Relationships, respect, and reciprocity. Relationships are probably the most important one when it comes to reconciliation. The chair of the TRC, Murray Sinclair, said that reconciliation is about forging and maintaining respectful relationships. There are no shortcuts. Relationships, uh, you know, relationships with indigenous people, uh, it's, it's about getting to know your neighbors. Uh, how many of you here have been in a romantic relationship? Boy, not many of you. <laughs> uh, I'm good. To, it's glad to see that some people have been in a romantic relationship. Um, I am certainly not the right person to ask about the secrets of success to a romantic relationship. Uh, but separate beds, maybe. I don't know. Uh, um, but I do know that relationships with Indigenous people are a lot like relation romantic relationships. Um, you know, there's, there's the good, 
There's going to be good times. There's going to be rocky times. But if you want your relationship to work, uh, you don't bail out. Don't bail out on a relationship just because things get rocky. Humor helps when you're trying to build a relationship. Uh, an old family friend is here this evening, Orm Mitchell. Uh, when uh, he saw me pull up in my white rental vehicle this evening, he said that the, the Blackfeet, is that correct? The Blackfeet have a word for white. Stony. The Stony have a, have a word for white. What is the word? Wasiju. Wasiju. And what does Wasiju mean? The ugly, white, hairy ones. <laughs> a sense of humor helps when you're building relationships with indigenous people. So good luck in building your relationships because it's so much based on communication and trust and that's where relationships are built. The second R is respect. And I want to tell you a story about respect. Not long after I went, left Lakefield College, I went to live on a trap line in James Bay, Northern Quebec. This is a picture of me. Look at the size of those glasses. Oh my God. <laughs> you can tell it's the 80s. It's awful. I think I'm wearing a Lakefield sweatshirt there, Anne-Marie. It looks like it to me. Um, and I was out there with an old man, Robbie Matthews Sr. And every time we killed and ate a beaver, Robbie would ask me to take the bones of the beaver and put them back into the lake. Uh, one fortunate day we shot a bear and Robbie asked me to hang the bones of the bear in the trees all over the camp. And, and the reason that Robbie was asking me to do this was to show respect for the animals. Because in our teachings amongst the Cree and amongst the Anishinaabe, um, you know, it's not the hunter who is going out and getting the animal. It is the animal that is stepping in the way of our rifle or our shotgun and giving their life to us. It is the fish that is swimming into our net. It's the fur-bearing animal that is choosing to step in our traps, which is why we pay so much respect to those animals, because they are choosing to, they're, they're taking it easy on us. They're under, and so we take it easy on them in return. They help us. And that is kind of the, 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 the essence of respect. In, in Anishinaabemwin, the word is manadendemwin. Of course, the Anishinaabeg here among us know that manadendemwin, respect, is one of our seven grandfather teachings, which are the, the, the rules the teachings that we've been given to live a good life, respect is so important as one of those teachings. It's the way we honor creation by showing respect. And so respect is really important when it comes to reconciliation because for so long, outsiders came to our communities and didn't show respect. They didn't show respect for our stories. They didn't show respect for our land. They didn't show respect for our children. They didn't show respect for our bones. The third R is reciprocity. And indigenous people are, are different right across this country. You know, Anishinaabe is not like, is, is not like Hulkaminam, but, but and, and they're certainly not like the Maori uh, or the Sami. But if, if, if there are universal values amongst indigenous people in this world, uh, I think that, that Reciprocity is probably one of them. Giving back. You know, this, this value of giving back. Uh, we do that here in, in Anishinaabeg territory by sharing tobacco, for example, with an elder when we ask them to speak. So when it comes to reconciliation, I would ask you this question. What are you doing? What are you doing to give back to Indigenous communities? There are lots of people that want to take from our communities, but what are you doing to give back? And there are lots of simple ways. I, 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 don't, I don't expect you all to be Bill Gates, you know, uh, and, to be, and to be bestowing billions of dollars upon indigenous communities. There are lots of simple ways that you can give back. You know, whether it's shopping indigenous, 
at Christmas time buying indigenous music or buying indigenous authors, indigenous clothing. I hear people saying, Should I, is, it, is it appropriation if I wear indigenous clothing? Talk to an indigenous fashion designer, no way! <laughs> Apple pay, I take it. <clears throat> Um, if you ask for an indigenous elder or a drum group to come play at the beginning of a song, please provide them an honorarium. Uh, if, you're, if you're working for a corporation or a university, I would hope that you're practicing procurement policies where you're supporting indigenous businesses when it comes to you know, food, videographers, tech people. There are lots of indigenous computer stores out there. Hope you're buying some. <laughs> the biggest expression of reciprocity could be land back. Leave that for another day. So when I get these emails from people who say, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to start, I say there's a roadmap. There's a roadmap to reconciliation. And it's got to be more than land acknowledgements. It's got to be more than wearing an orange t-shirt. It starts with having a strategy. Okay, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Saint the author of The Little Prince, uh, he said, uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And I see that a lot from indigenous organizations. I see that, at the, I saw that at the CBC actually. Lots of people with good ideas, but no one planning it, no one figuring it out, no one figuring out the long-term strategy. Sit down, figure out a strategy, figure out a plan, figure out if it's working, check in, change things if it's not working. Hire more indigenous people. It's gotta happen. If you're going to develop a strategy, if you're going to change things, you've got to have indigenous people on your team. And as I said, build relationships, act with respect, remember reciprocity. These are all things that are roadmap to reconciliation, and they're things that each and every one of us can do to make things better in this country. So for those of you who are non-Indigenous, that's your responsibility when it comes to reconciliation. Be a good neighbor. Be a good treaty partner. Those are all the responsibilities of non-Indigenous folks in this country. <clears throat> for the Indigenous people in the room, we have responsibilities too when it comes to reconciliation. And I want to end my talk this way. Because it was hard. It was hard spending a, a year on the island of Penelicut hearing about the things that had been torn apart by the Cooper Island Residential School. I started this talk talking about school. And I want to end this talk talking about school. Because this is a Tamena school, high school, <coughs> where Hokaminam children now go. And it is a very different place from the Cooper Island Indian Residential School. There is Hulkaminam artwork on the walls. There is Hulkaminam language on the door signs. The students are learning. This is, I, I was, I asked to go visit the school and this is me, this is again during the pandemic, that's me recording with the mask on there. They, they brought me to a longhouse that's on the school grounds. And the children, the little children and the big children, they got up and they danced. They danced for us. They shared with us the welcome song. And they shared the paddle song with us as we sat there and recorded. And I tell you, the tears were rolling down my cheeks watching those little children dancing those songs, singing, because they were doing the things that their ancestors, their grandparents and great-grandparents couldn't do. Their education is very different. They are being taught who they are and where they come from. And for the indigenous people in the room, 
when it comes to reconciliation, those are our responsibilities. Those are our responsibilities. Take care of your families. Heal your families. No one else can do that for you. You need to do that for yourself and for your families and your children and your children after that. Help build strong communities that are built on our culture, our vibrant and rich culture. Indigenous people in the room, those are our responsibilities when it comes to reconciliation. And so Indigenous people in this room and Indigenous, non-Indigenous people in this room, we have our work cut out for us. There's no doubt about it. But I am confident that together, like those children, we're going to make a stronger country for everyone. Miigwech. Miigwech. Yeah.